finally here. Had too much time to think about this. This thing is real loud. And I'm going to get louder. This is my quiet voice. That's your inside voice? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I've had a month or so to think about that. It's too much time, Brother Robin. I, I've run things through my mind and worrying about things coming up where I couldn't be here and things have been happening. And I promise you, as soon as I told Kim that I'd come, it's all broke loose. And my struggle has been in this message tonight is pretty much what God has taught me in the last couple months. And it's about one thing that I think we as Christians today need more than anything else. And it's just a simple trust. Trusting in Jesus Christ no matter what it looks like. No matter what's happening in your world or in your thoughts or uh, what's going on in your life. We need to, as the church, as believers today, you need to just trust Him. And you know how you learn that? You go through some stuff. He don't just give you trust. And then all of a sudden you just got it. He puts you through things and teach you to trust him. And that's what I've learned over the last several weeks. Uh, things has come up and I, I was like, man, something's going to happen. I, and, then, and all I could do was look up because he kept bringing me through it. And, I, and I'm like, what are you doing? I just want to go to Arkansas and preach to my family and to my friends and folks. I live in Oxford, Mississippi, but this is my home and I'm at home tonight. And I, I'm honored to be here. I'm honored to stand before you. And I take with all my heart what God has for you tonight and what he's laid on my heart. And it's very simple. Just to trust him. No matter what it looks like. No matter what you're going through. No matter how bad it is. He's repeatedly shown me in the 18 years that I've been in the ministry. It's like a small voice in my ear saying, Rusty, just trust me. I got you back. But we have to learn through those things to simply just trust Him. And tonight I want to talk to you about just trusting in Jesus Christ no matter what life throws at you, no matter what's going on in your world. But before we begin tonight, I need to pray. It's been a long day and I've had a lot of distractions and I just want you to bow with me for before we begin tonight. Dear precious Heavenly Father, I bow before your throne of grace and praise you. For your love and for your mercy and for your grace and for the patience you show us every day that we're undeserving of. Lord, I want to thank you tonight for the little things you do in our lives that we all too often take for granted. But I pray tonight for this church, for this body of believers. I pray for the heart of every man and every woman and every child in your house. As we've gathered in your name tonight, I ask you, Lord, to bless the reading of your word. And bless the hearts of your people. That, Lord, tonight we take something away from the table to use in the struggles of life and the things that we're going to face tomorrow. And, Lord, I ask you, Lord, to take what you've laid on my heart, use it for your honor and your glory and yours alone. But I pray tonight that your Holy Spirit would be with us, that your presence would be here. Lord, because I know without you this is all in vain. And I ask you tonight, Lord, your blessings on this church and your blessings tonight on our worship that would bring glory and honor to you. I pray all this tonight. In the precious name of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen, amen. and amen. You'll turn with me tonight to the Gospel of Luke in the 18th chapter. The Gospel of Luke in the 18th chapter. As you turn there tonight, think what God about. wants to teach us and what God wants to show us. The number one thing we need to learn as a Christian, folks, so often my brothers and sisters in Christ come to me and say, Brother Rusty, I've been praying for patience. And it ain't happening. And people come to me and say, I've been praying for faith. And it ain't happening. And I think they don't understand. And I've learned through the hard way. I have to learn everything in life the hard way. And it's because I have to be hard-headed and God has to show me. And we need to understand this tonight. God don't just give you patience because you ask for it. He don't just give you wisdom before, because you ask for it. He don't just give you faith because you ask for it. And I've learned this, folks, years ago when I was a young fella, and I loved a coon hunter. You can take a coon dog out into the woods, and you can make a coon dog out of it. But all of a sudden, he starts running deer. 
And he's not a coon dog till you break him off those deer. No matter how good a coon dog he is, if he ain't broke, he ain't a coon dog. And you can take him in some other woods where there ain't no deer. And he can be the best coon dog in the world. But until you broke him off those deer, you haven't accomplished anything. And what I'm saying is tonight, till you take that coon dog back in those woods where those deer are. And folks, out in Mississippi, you throw a, deer, a coon dog out anywhere, the odds are he's going to run up on a deer before he runs up on a coon. And it's hard to train him. And that's how God works in your life and in mine, folks. He don't just grant you your request. He throws you in the middle of it. And he pounds you and he pounds you and he brings you before that until you learn. And that's how he teaches you patience. Because, folks, as a Christian, I want you to know, you pray for patience. Folks, he is going to turn everything in the world. You're going to think the walls are coming in on top of you. Why? And we're like, God, what are you doing? I just asked for patience. He's saying, Rusty, I'm teaching you patience. You either trust me or you don't. And why I say that tonight is, folks, that what we're looking at, and repeatedly in the Scripture, I found over 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ told us a story. He told us a story about two men walking into the temple. Now these two men walk into the temple and he plainly tells us one of them is a very religious man and one of them is a sinner. And he goes on to tell us in this story that the religious man walks into the temple and stands before the altar and he looks up to God and he says, God, I thank you that I go to church every Sunday. I thank you that I give my tithes and my offerings. I thank you that I've served you faithfully all my life. And I thank you, God, that I'm not like this sinner. And the scripture says the religious man's prayer was rejected. And then he goes on to tell us that the sinner walked into the temple and he couldn't even make it to the altar. He fell down on his knees. And he begged God and he said, have mercy upon me, a sinner. And the scripture goes on to tell us in detail that the sinner's press, his prayer was requested. It was blessed by God. And not only that, as you look in the text what Jesus was saying, folks, the religious man's prayer was not only rejected, but he was rejected. The sinner's prayer was accepted by God, and he was accepted. Now, if you look in Luke, in the Gospel of Luke, in the 18th chapter, verse 10, the words in red tonight, and I want you to look at what Jesus says as he's talking to this crowd that stands before him. And Jesus says, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and he prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, the extortioners and unjust and adulterers, and even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat on his breast saying, God be merciful to me a sinner. And Jesus said, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and everyone who humbles himself will be exalted. The words in red, Jesus said this, but I want you to catch this tonight. Number one, you see the religious man who prayed every day, who went to God's house every day, who tithed all of his earnings, and everything that he did, he had a problem. He had an eye problem. You notice five times in two little short verses, everything he said was I. Ask yourself tonight, how many times do you say I when you pray? This man had a problem that folks ought to catch our attention. Jesus wanted them to know, understand the congregation that stood around him was mostly religious people. And Jesus wanted them to understand why was the religious man prayer rejected and the sinner's prayer was accepted because the religious man was trying. 
And the sinner was trusting. Folks, you look at this text and you see, folks, that something has always been, but we look over it. Religion is based. Religion is based on trying. Christianity is based on simply trusting. Religion is a man trying to work his way to God. Christianity is a man just trusting that God has already done it all. And just trusting him in life. And if that ain't good enough for you tonight, from the very beginning of time, I'm talking about all the way to the beginning. In Genesis chapter 4, two brothers came to the altar with their sacrifices to God. The oldest brother came. He brought his sacrifice. He was a farmer. Had him a nice garden. God had blessed him. And he brought before the altar and he laid his fruits there. An altar, a sacrifice to God. And the scripture says God rejected him and he rejected his sacrifice. Abel, the younger brother, he came to the altar with his, a lamb. He was a shepherd. And he brought that lamb to the altar and the scripture plainly tells us his, his offering was accepted. But not only was his offering accepted, he was accepted. You know the rest of the story, but we need to ask ourselves tonight. Why was Cain's rejected? Why was Abel's accepted? Because Cain was trying. He brought with the work of his hands and the sweat of his brow an offering to God and God rejected it because he was trying. Abel brought his offering before the altar which is symbolic for what Jesus Christ was going to do for him. Shed a lamb's blood. Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who came to take away the sin of the world, painted a picture for every single one of us from that moment on. Abel was trusting in that what Jesus was going to do. Folks, we look at that over and over, and I struggle with this one thing in our Christian life, in our Christian faith. Because I know every single one of us folks struggle with it. I struggle with it every day and God has to remind me, Rusty, quit trying and start trusting. Quit trying and start trusting. Here's the image that I get. I remember my oldest granddaughter when I was trying to teach her how to float. She looked at me and she said, Papa, teach me how to float. And repeatedly in this, if you think just for a moment today, just recall the moment when someone tried to teach you how to float. And I told Christian, and I said, now honey, listen to me. If you do just what I say, you'll float. Okay, Peppa. I said, listen to this logic. Water will hold a boat. Water will hold ships. Water will hold entire navies. And if you'll just trust the water and lay back and relax, you float. She says, okay, Bebo. She lays back in the water, and I see every tension, every muscle in her body is vibrating. And she says, I'll try it. And she lays back in the water. And what happens? She floats to the bottom. <laughs> she comes up grasping for air, and I fuss at her. I said, you didn't do what I told you to do. I said, just trust the water. It's all you got to do. She says, okay, I'll try it again. She lays back, and I can see her tensing up and her muscles flaring. She lays back in the water, and she floats right to the bottom again. And repeatedly that happened. Till finally she was exhausted, and she said, Okay, live or die, I'll try it again. And she lays back in the water. And her little mind is like, Man, this works. And she floats. People, what the scripture is telling me and you tonight is it's very simple, but it's hard because it's against human nature. We always try to fix something. We always try to do something. But folks, 
Jesus Christ did it all. He accomplished it all. And we need to remind ourselves daily to quit trying and start trusting. To trust in Him. And here's the problem. You cannot live the Christian life. I've come to the conclusion, and it's a fact. You cannot live the Christian life. Because the Christian life is supernatural. We can't, we can't accomplish what is supernatural. And the reason I say that is, folks, there's three supernatural acts that happened in our lives as a Christian. And I believe all of you agree with me. There's the first stage, the second stage, and the third stage. The first stage and the third stage, we all, I think, would agree with. Conversion is the first stage of salvation. The conversion, I think all of us would believe without any doubt. Conversion is a supernatural act, and God has to do it. We can't do it. We can't save ourselves. The Holy Spirit convicts us that we're lost and we're headed for hell and we want Jesus Christ into our life and we ask Him. That conversion, folks, that takes place in a child of God's life is supernatural. It is miraculous and we cannot do it. The third one is this. The resurrection. We get saved. It's supernatural. Conversion comes to salvation. It is supernatural. We know God has to do it. The third thing is the resurrection. There ain't nobody here tonight that thinks when you go to the grave that you can raise yourself up out of it. That's a supernatural thing. God has to do it. But here's the problem. We understand that we cannot do the conversion. We cannot accomplish salvation. We all understand that we can't raise ourselves from the grave. We have to trust God. Jesus said, if you believe in me, I will raise you. And we trust him with that because it's supernatural. We can't do it. But the middle one, folks, I've seen all my life. I've been there. I've done that. Folks walk the aisle. They tell the preacher they want to be saved. They go through the baptism of waters. And guess what? Then they go out the back door and they never come back. Do you know why that is? Because we try and we try and we try. And every single person, every single thing, the same thing happens. You get saved and all of a sudden you want to try harder and you want to do better and you want to do the Christian thing. You want to read your Bible. You want to pray every day. You want to be in church every time it happens. And you try and you try and you try till you break. And it's called the quitter. What happens is you try to live the Christian life and inside your mind, whether you tell anybody else, I've tried to live the Christian life. I can't do it. I'm going to leave it to somebody else. And you go back out into the world and you're broken. And we have the all over this planet. This people has been through that. And some reason or another, we don't recognize what is happening. Because we don't teach them. We teach them that salvation is supernatural. We teach them that raised from the grave is supernatural. But we need to understand, living the Christian life is supernatural. Now, I didn't say we can't live the Christian life. Don't nobody go out here tonight and say, Brother Rusty said, okay, none of us live the Christian life, so throw our hands up and give up. That's not what I'm saying. There is men and women that have lived the Christian life all over this world. Look around you. But they didn't do it. They didn't live it. They trusted in Jesus Christ. And over in the scripture that so often we don't talk about, the Holy Spirit, when you get saved, comes and lives inside of you and empowers you to do the supernatural. But the problem is folks are trying to do supernatural things in the flesh and it won't happen. It never has. And I tell you tonight a story that meant a lot to me at a time in my life. Mike Gilchrist, a pastor and an author, that I've looked up to and I've read his books and one night I was broken. I'd been pushed to the max and I was reading a book that he wrote and he was telling about his first pastor. He was a young preacher in his first church. 
where he served for like two and a half years and he served in that church and that church had a little lady that every time he gave an invitation, she would walk down the aisle, she would put her hands around him, she was blubbering and crying. And she'd say, preacher, I want to try harder, I want to do better. And he'd pat her on the back in his inexperience and say, God bless you, be seated. He said that went on just about every Sunday for the two and a half years that he was pastor there. Years went by and he left and went to another church and he'd lost communication with these families in this church and years went by and this church called him back in the absence of their pastor wanting him to fill in for him one Sunday. Now he got more mature. He growed up. And he went back and was enjoying the moment. He sat there as they went through the psalm service and he sat in a chair there and looked out at the congregation and he thought, boy, just like old times. As he looked at the congregation and I've been there. Things run through your mind and I know it's distracted, but it happens. And as he looked through the crowd, as they went through the psalm service and then he got up and he preached the message that the Lord had laid on his heart. And they had the invitation, and he stood in the absence of their, pressure, their pastors. The invitation was given. And as soon as he got started, the little lady jumped out of the aisle and started running toward him. And he said, boy, just like old times. <laughs> she come down and put her arms around him, and she was crying again. And he was thinking, I'm fixing to let her have it. I'm a mature pastor now. I'm fixing to tell her like it is. When she blurted out, I want you to know that I'm saved now. I, I wanted to tell you, and I want to stand up in front of this church, and I want to give my testimony, because I believe God wants me to. And she stood up there, and he said, yes, ma'am. And she stood there, and she stood before the congregation, and this is what she told. She says, I was born and raised in the church. She said, when I was old enough to tithe, I tithed every Sunday. When I got a little older, I taught Sunday school and I taught training unit. I'd done everything there was to do. And I worked myself to death in the church. And after every Sunday night, I would go home and get on my knees in my room. And I would pray to God and pour my heart out. But it always felt like my prayers went no higher than the ceiling. And she would pray. God, I'm doing all that I can do for you. Is it not enough? And the heavens were silent all those years. But she stood before that congregation and she had had a mental and a physical and a mental breakdown. And then she come to the knowledge that she was trying instead of trusting. And she trusted Jesus Christ for the first time in her life. And she quit all that working. And she quit all that trying to push her to this point. To either give or die. And she trusted Jesus Christ. And it filled that emptiness she had and realized she had nothing else to do but just trust him. And folks, as I read that in the time of my life that I was in, in the same place. Folks, about 20 years ago, before I even thought about surrendering to the ministry, I got married, settled down, was trying to do what was right, got involved in the church. The next thing you know, I was teaching training union, Sunday school, on every committee the church had, worked with the youth, and I was doing everything that I could. Till I broke. And one night I was on my knees and I remember pouring my heart out to God. I'm trying as hard as I can and it feels like the world is caving in on me. God, what are you doing to me? And I heard a small voice that said, Rusty, quit trying and start trusting. Quit trying and start trusting. Folks, that is what your life is about. It's not our efforts or what we can do. But if you turn me to the book of Romans tonight. The book of Romans, third chapter, 
We'll start in verse 20. The Apostle Paul writes here, and this whole chapter is about this very subject. Quit trying and start trusting. Now we look at the text in verse 20, and the Apostle Paul says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Now I want you to think about this text, thinking about, quit trying, start trusting. Paul says, therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified. What Paul is saying, by doing the law. Folks, this was the Pharisees' biggest hang-up. This is why they crucified Christ. They lived by the law to the depths of their heart. They, everything they had, memorized the scriptures, go to church every day, pray till there was calluses on their knees. But they were so caught up in the law because they thought the law was salvation. And what Paul is trying to tell the people and trying to tell us today, all the law does is paints a picture in our mind of what sin is. It never had the point for salvation. There was no salvation ever in the law. It was for man to understand as he read the law and he tried to keep it that it was impossible. No man other than Jesus Christ has ever kept the law. And the struggles of the Jews and the Gentiles that the Apostle Paul here is writing to. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. The law is for us to understand. This is God's law. And I can't keep it. It's impossible. You try it. And we look down at verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have tried to keep the law and failed. Verse 28. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Now skip over. Chapter 4, verse 5. But to him who does not work but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. We read this again. Listen. But to him who does not work but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, which is Jesus Christ, his faith is accounted for him righteousness. What is Paul saying? You can't keep the law. And God's original plans for the law, folks, was to paint a picture in our minds. The law never accomplished salvation, but it prepared people's hearts to understand our need for Jesus Christ. And the only way for us to have that salvation is through him. Now tonight, if you'll turn me to Galatians chapter 2, my, va my favorite text. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. This scripture defines Christianity. There's nothing to explain. But we read it, folks, if you want to understand what Christianity is about. It says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. Folks, you look at that text and it defines the Christian life and that's what we need to measure up to. But we look at this text and what Paul is plainly telling us in good old English. If trying accomplishes anything, then Jesus Christ died on the cross in vain. You get that? If trying accomplishes anything, then Christ died on the cross in vain. Folks, I still have to be reminded of this. Every single one of us will. But folks, we have to trust him. And everything that happens in our lives, whether good or bad or messed up in our way of thinking or the things that happen that we get overwhelmed and you don't know what to do, 
Just trust him. I promise you every single time when you just give it to him and trust him, it'll work out. Sometimes it don't make sense. Sometimes you don't think he's going to come through. Sometimes, folks, you find yourself in a mess. Sometimes life is overwhelming. But the one thing he's repeatedly shown me, just trust him. And when the smoke clears, I promise you, you're going to look up to him and say thank you. Because he's going to bring you through it one way or another. And the hardest things you face in life, he may very well be just teaching. The whole circumstance was all created just to teach you something. So trust him with it. If you'll bow with me tonight for a word of prayer. The Heavenly Father, Lord, I come to you and I thank you that, Lord, trying has never accomplished anything. But trust in you accomplishes everything. And I pray tonight for the faith. The faith in my heart and in my life where I fail thee every day. But I've learned to trust you. And I pray for the hearts of your people tonight. And I lift them up to you. I pray for this church. I pray for your anointed spirit and your presence. That Lord, more than anything else in our life, we want you. We want you in our lives. We want your presence in our lives to help us through the things that we face. But I come to you tonight with all the humility that I can gather to praise you. That when we panic and when we fear and when we worry and anxiety kicks in, that your spirit would just tell us to trust you, that you got our backs. And I lift up this congregation tonight. I pray for the heart of every person here. I don't know what they're dealing with or what they're going through, but I know you do. And I pray tonight that we would just learn to simply trust you like floating on water. I praise you. I thank you. I love you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. And amen.